girl. Just a girl, just a girl. How are you, honey? This we're is bolt cutters. This is our best friend. He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to Good evening and thanks for joining us. 13 years of pain for many families, sleepless nights for detectives, and general confusion for the people of Spartanburg County. All answered in a matter of days when a woman was found chained alive. It was very bloody, uh, very gruesome. The man at the middle of it all, Todd Colehab. I mean, as a journalist, this is one of those cases that you only really dream up. You know, it's sort of larger than life, um, almost like a you're just reading a horror book or something. I cleared in under 30 seconds. You what now? I cleared that going under 30 seconds. You gotta live proud. I'm sorry, but she got proud. Families brought together in the midst of tragedy. The families of Charlie David Carver and Scott Ponder coming face to face with the person who took it all away. There would actually be a future for the two of you. He, he told me that. He told me that. He, he explained Stockholm Syndrome to me and told me that it would kick in and then we'd be happy together. Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, I post videos pertaining conspiracy theories, controversial people, true crime, and all things spooky, scary, skeletons. Yeah, so if you're into any of that, make sure to subscribe and if not, totally chill. Let's just hang out, grab a drink, grab a snack, even grab your makeup if you want. The story that we're going to be talking about today is the story of Todd Colip and his insane line of crimes. Without further ado, I don't think there's much else I need to say in this intro. But before we get into the rest of today's video, I do want to give a big, big thank you to Function of Beauty for sponsoring today's video. Now, everyone's hair is different. Some of us have curly hair, wavy hair, straight hair, frizzy hair, and it's really hard to find a regular drugstore shampoo and conditioner that can actually help you with all of your individual needs. But thanks to Function of Beauty, that can all work. Function of Beauty is a monthly subscription service that that can actually help you out with all of your individual hair needs and it's super super easy to get it all you need to do is go to their website and take a short quiz you just first put in your info about your hair type then move on to your top five hair needs I wanted to focus on more hydrating replenishing volumizing and lengthening my hair then you go on to the delicious smell that you want to choose as well as the color to match your bathroom aesthetic and choose your name to go on the bottle to make it all yours I've been using function of beauty for about a month now and I already have seen so many improvements with my hair especially with the hair serum that adds that extra healthy shine to my hair and repairs my split ends with my past shampoo and conditioner I just felt like it worked but it didn't really work the way that I wanted it to work if I had a dry scalp it would help with the dry scalp but it wouldn't really help with the split ends and if it did help with the split ends it wasn't really helping with the lengthening of my hair I just couldn't find a perfect combo combination that fulfilled everything that I wanted until I found Function of Beauty. And I could not recommend enough to go custom because now I no longer have the usual problems as I did have and all of my hair care needs are finally met. Function of Beauty products are also dermatologist tested so I know that it won't irritate my scalp. Function of Beauty also uses clean and vegan ingredients so that means no sulfates, no parabens, non-GMOs. I don't know if you can tell but right now I have like no product in my hair, no heat. This is literally just my natural hair. I quite literally woke up like this. I always used to have to go through the struggle of waking up every morning and having to straighten my hair to get rid of frizziness or putting all these crazy chemicals and products in my hair. But thanks to Function of Beauty, I no longer have to do that and it saves me so much hassle in the morning. Now, if you guys want your own bottle of Function of Beauty, all you need to do is click the link in the description for 20% off your very first set. So again, thank you so, so much to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video and now back to your video let's dive right in Todd Kolip was born on March 7th 1971 making him a Pisces and he was born in Florida to his mother and father he is indeed an only child prior to the parents being pregnant and having Todd they were actually a pretty happy couple and it wasn't until uh, Todd's mom got pregnant that their relationship really started to take a big downfall they started fighting a lot disagreeing a lot 
and then when Todd was born about two months later that is when the parents got into a divorce when this divorce happened the mother did take custody of Todd and they moved from Florida to Georgia and they lived over there for a few years until they decided to move to South Carolina it wasn't until they moved to South Carolina where Todd's mom would then remarry now the stepdad at first actually really really liked Todd and liked Todd so much to the point where the stepfather then adopted Todd and then Todd got the last name Colip because that was his stepdad's last name started to develop a bear he's decided what calm down Haley. He started to develop a really big hatred for his stepfather. They did not get along like they used to. They would fight a lot. It was shortly after this remarriage where Todd started to show extreme signs of behavior and emotional issues. He would tend to lash out a lot and actually have really, really bad anger issues. The mom even recalls a few stories of when Todd was a kid. One of these stories, one day Todd was on the school bus with this little girl and the little girl teased Todd about his hair and he took out scissors and the little girl in the leg and if any of you guys are familiar with serial killers and you probably know that most serial killers tend to start off on animals first preferably when they're a child and that's exactly what happened to Todd Todd begged his mom to get him a gerbil because he just really really wanted a gerbil and his mom kept on telling him no you can't have a gerbil because you already have a goldfish and so Todd decided to go to his fish tank put bleach into the goldfish tank to make the fish die and then he would get a gerbil and so not only does this show like obviously Todd has had some real issues since a very young age and it also kind of foreshadows his adult life as well in meaning that he doesn't show any remorse for anything that he does like with this you would think that probably if a child saw a fish die it would typically be kind of traumatizing or if your dog runs away to a farm so to speak like it's very sad he just didn't really have the like mental capac I don't know what like what's that word I'm looking for um uh comprehension <laughs> He didn't really have the comprehension of what it meant to feel remorse for things or feel sorry for things. Not only did Todd do those things, the mother would always like buy brand new furniture and Todd would immediately destroy it by like cutting it up with scissors, getting stains all over it, and just completely like creating chaos for no reason it actually got so bad to the point where when Todd was only nine years old he was sent to a mental institution for three months to try to help his behavioral breakouts not just at home but at school the mother said that she even put locks on his door and locked him in his room overnight as well as putting locks on her own door because she just didn't trust Todd in the house while everybody else was like either gone or asleep but while he was in the mental institution at just nine years old they really started to find out more about Todd's mental state and they realized that for just a nine-year-old kid he had extreme graphic sexual fantasies now as I said he was just there for three months because they thought that like oh you're fixed goodbye soon as when he was released from this mental institution he actually ended up shooting a dog with a BB gun. Another example of how Todd just showed no remorse for anything that he did. A lot of people tend to get very emotional when animals are hurt because animal life is still a life. Like Todd just wasn't showing any sadness or remorse to these deaths. It did raise a lot of red flags. My screen time went down to four hours a day. That's probably the biggest flex I have. This was another thing of like Todd's characteristics is that he really thought he was better than everyone and was super, super cocky and just thought that he was like above all else. And this also came to school as well. He would barely try in school, but when he would take something like an IQ test or a psych evaluation, he would pass it perfectly. And they were actually going to diagnose him with what psychosis, I think it's called called 
psychosis, I believe. They were going to diagnose him with that, but a main factor of having psychosis is being detached from reality, which Todd was not detached from reality. I don't really know the specifics of why they didn't diagnose him with that. I just know that they did not. So things were just not looking good for the stepdad and Todd, but Todd actually found out that his real dad, whom he hadn't talked to in such a long time, shortly after the divorce, they just kind of lost all contact with each other. He actually found out that his real father was staying in Arizona. And once he found out that information, he got into contact with his biological father and started to ask him if it was okay if he moved out there with him because his stepdad was extremely abusive. And so the father said like, yeah, if you want to, like you can move out here. I don't care uh, if it's okay with your mom. And so he started begging his mom and telling her that he was going to off himself if she didn't allow him to move in with his dad. Obviously the mom was like, okay, I guess you can go because she doesn't want that to happen. In 1985 at 14 years old, that is when Todd went to go live with his biological father. Now I feel like in Todd's mind, this was going to go a lot better than what it actually did. Turns out his father was an extreme drunk and he would also bring girls over all the time and really didn't even pay attention to Todd. And I feel like that's kind of all Todd wanted. All he wanted was attention and affection. And so he thought that maybe by moving next to his dad that he would feel better and get that attention that he needs, that like connection with a father figure. As as I said, the father was not really the best, just didn't really pan out the way that Todd thought it was going to pan out. And so then the next year in 1986, that is when Todd at 15 would commit his very first serious crime. When Todd was 15, there was this girl down the street that was 14 that he had a big crush on. But the problem was, is that this girl had a boyfriend. And so he thought that if he had intercourse with her, then she would fall in love with him, thus he would get this girl. And so then he decides to remember how I said earlier, he had very like graphic sexual fantasies for such a young kid. Basically what he did, he went down the street to her house, knocked on her door, she came to the door and he said that her boyfriend was at Todd's house and he wanted to talk to her. And the girl was like, well, if he wanted to talk to me, then why are you coming to my door? He was like, well, apparently it's something something serious and he's kind of embarrassed. He told me to come here, not him, because he was too scared to like come and talk to you. And then she was like, okay, mind you, this girl is like only 14 years old. So she's like, okay. And so then she goes over to Todd's house and obviously her boyfriend is not there. He handcuffed her, taped her mouth shut and SA'd her. And then when he was done, he walked her back to her house with a gun to her back, saying that if she dares say a word to anyone, he would shoot her little siblings. Now, the girl did the right thing, most like bravest and right thing to do is that she decided to tell her grandmother anyways, uh, tell her grandmother of what happened. Her and her grandmother went to the police. The police did like a body scan on her and so saw that, you know, she was SA'd and then they went to Todd's house and they found the tape, the handcuffs, like the whole thing. Oh yeah, I didn't even mention this. The father was out on a business trip. That's how he was able to get away with this whole thing. And mind you, he is 15 years old, like a sophomore in high school. He went to the police, you know, he confessed to the police because it was already looking really bad for him. And he ended up being tried as an adult and serving 15 years. The mother actually came out because the mother at this point is in South Carolina and she was trying to repeal against his, his plea. And she would write letters to the court, basically saying the most like grossest of things saying that the girl was over dramatizing it she was like oh well he walked her home like that's sweet that's romantic she wouldn't allow him to walk her home if something bad did happen even though they literally found the evidence in the house the mother was trying to grasp that her son just wasn't as bad as he actually was now on top of the 15 year sentence he was also going to be considered a registered 
offender as well as a felony on his record. Now, while he was in jail, a lot of like the police guards and other people say that Todd was quite the angel in jail. He would never cause problems. He would always do what he was told. He was always on top of things. Like Todd was the perfect prisoner and so perfect to the point where in 2001 he was actually released two years early so he ended up serving 13 years instead of 15 years whilst todd was in jail because as i said he entered jail when he was only 15 years old he ended up finishing high school in jail as well as getting two college degrees one in computer science and another in business and in 2001 at this point he's 30 years old he then decides to get his real estate license as as well as his pilot license. Why he got his pilot license will be known later, but it, it was just, I don't know. I don't want to spoil it, but it's a little odd why he got it. But anyways, but a fault of Todd's as well is that when you become like a real estate agent or a real estate broker and you're applying to agencies, you actually have to do a mandatory background check. And so he went to this one agency and they obviously like, you know, did a background check. They saw that he had a felony and asked him like, hey, it says that you're a registered sex offender. And also you were in jail since you were 15 years old. Can you tell me a little bit about those felonies. So Todd had a chance to explain himself and explain his crimes, but completely twisting the story. He basically explained the story as him when he was just a 15 year old kid. He had a girlfriend and they went for a joy ride together while the father didn't know. And then when the two got back to the house, the father started making all these accusations and claims and then the police believed the girl. So he ended up going to jail. Obviously, you and I know that is very, very far from the truth. But a big thing about Todd as well is that he has a big way with words. I need to sneeze. <coughs> Thank you if you said bless you. But anyway, Todd had a really, really big way with his word. He can read people very easily because of this well-liked personality actually get him out of a lot of trouble. And the real estate agency ended up hiring him on anyways. Now, after a while, he decided that he wanted to make his own real estate agency called TKA Agency that actually um, had around a dozen people working for him. And a lot of his coworkers also described Todd as very suspicious make like really weird comments at the girls working there and no one really thought too much into it they were like oh he's just a creepy white guy what else is new now two years later in 2003 this is when todd actually committed his second crime but this crime would actually go unsolved for 13 years in 2003 todd went to this place called super bikes motorsports and it was like a motorcycle shop and todd really wanted a motorcycle so he went there and he bought one he didn't even realize until after buying it that he actually had no clue how to ride a motorcycle if any of you guys are familiar with motorcycles or maybe you've ridden one bigger motorcycles are a lot more to manage and maneuver you're going to need like a little bit more experience rather than just not like a small one but kind of like one that fits your size with Todd he bought one that was like way too big for him he just bought it because it looked really cool and as I said Todd is like super cocky he has this really big ego so he thought that if he bought this huge motorcycle it would make him look really cool and so he bought the motorcycle did not know how to use it and so then he took it back to the motorcycle place and was like hey I actually don't know how to ride a motorcycle is there a way I can return this or maybe like trade it in for a smaller bike now the people at super bikes just started they weren't like attacking him but they were kind of making jokes at him like oh why would you buy a motorcycle if you don't know how to ride it because since he was a big motorcycle it was kind of expensive and so they were like oh you just got all this money to blow and apparently like i guess the people had told him in the beginning that like oh if you have no experience i would go for a smaller one not like a huge monster truck it's basically like having 
a semi truck as your first car sort of like it's just a totally different experience and you're not going to know how to drive it very well they started like telling him this you shouldn't buy that big motorcycle but then he bought it anyways and then he ended up taking it back so they started just like teasing him about it and so he was like you know what whatever i'll just take the motorcycle home it's not that big of a deal like i'm gonna come back and i'm gonna know how to ride it and i'm gonna show you guys so he ended up taking it back home to learn how to ride it and then two days later the motorcycle had actually got stolen he went back to the motorcycle place looking for another motorcycle to buy and then he told the shop that his other motorcycle was actually stolen they were like oh it was probably stolen because you didn't know how to ride it like someone probably saw you struggling and thought he's not going to use this sort of jokes like it wasn't anything brutal it was just kind of you know poking fun at the fact that he bought an expensive motorcycle and then he tried to return it because he didn't know how to use it and then he took it home anyways to be super brave and tough and then it ends up getting stolen so since todd is getting picked on again he feels very attacked and so he feels like he needs to attack them in return what he does he frequently goes back to the bike shop every few days and just looks at motorcycles he doesn't buy anything he doesn't say anything looks at motorcycles and they'll like crack a joke like maybe one joke or something because he's coming back all the time he would get on motorcycles he would test drive some at this point they were kind of helping him out a little bit because they were like okay well maybe this guy really doesn't know how to mo drive a motorcycle and he just really wants to it started to be like a little bit nicer to him but unfortunately it was a little bit too late for that because one day todd actually went back to super bikes with a and decided that he was going to shoot up the husband, the wife, the mechanic, and the young worker. And so he went there with his gun and he just kind of, you know, walked around for a little bit, saw the motorcycles like he typically does. He waited for all of the customers to leave, which like in his interview a while later, he explains this situation as if he was in the right. And he starts saying like, oh yeah, so I'm such a good guy that I waited for all the customers to leave before I for people you know it, he was trying so desperately to make himself look like the victim but it just made him look just like so dumb not everybody was there went and uh, sat on a few bikes did my usual and doing my best to make sure that the pain customers were not there waiting on what this was during the time as you know that it was not busy Mm -hmm. That's just time that was not after work when I would have a lot of people in there. Um did not want to shoot up. He waits till everybody leaves and then he goes up to the front desk and says, hey, I actually want to buy this bike right here. And so they're like, okay, let's get you this bike. Like we'll have our mechanic fix it up for you. So the mechanic takes the motorcycle to the back room. Todd, a few minutes later, followed the mechanic into the back room and shot him in the chest three times. Once these guys shots went off the mother the father and the young employee heard all of this commotion so they ran to the back to see what was going on and then once todd sees all three of them he immediately shoots the mom and she falls to the ground the two boys start running running to the door and he actually ends up shooting the father in the doorway as well as the young boy outside now he shoots all four of these people and immediately when he does he makes a break for it he gets in his car and drives off and no one knew who committed this crime for a whole 13 years and now another reason why like they couldn't figure out that it was todd is because that there were no fingerprints on the scene prince is on the door I use my knuckles instead of my hand, my hand to open the door. And the reason you have no prints on any of the shell casings mm -hmm. is I wear two pairs of gloves when loading every firearm, even in practice. The greatest amount of evidence that they had were like past customers that were there gave a description of the man but that was really it and again in the interview he says all of this like he's proud of it there was another part in this interview that i'll show as i said for some reason he was just like so proud of himself to the point where he actually told the police officers that he cleared it out in 30 seconds and that they would be proud of him that was one big villain yeah. I cleared it in under 30 seconds. You what now? I cleared that going in under 30 seconds. You got a little bit proud. 
I'm sorry, but she does whip and proud. So again, there comes in that what I said earlier, that need for attention, that like, oh, everyone, look at me. I'm doing all these crazy things. Why won't anyone pay attention to me sort of mentality? Even though he was an only child, his parents divorced at a young age and his stepdad and him didn't really get along. And then when he moved in with his biological father, they didn't really get along either. And then he was in prison for 15 years. So like there was really no love or affection in his life life from a very young age. 13 years later in 2016, August of 2016, that is when Todd would then commit the crime that actually ended up getting him caught. Totally forgot to mention this, but you know how like Todd was doing his whole real estate business and everything? Basically, whilst he was doing all his real estate business, he was living in South Carolina to be closer to his mother. I forgot to mention that, but I'm mentioning it now. August of 2016, 14 years later, there was this woman named Kayla Brown who was 30 years old and her boyfriend Charles Carver who was 32 years old recently just moved to South Carolina because they bought a house together they were a young couple and they really wanted to you know start making things more serious and they both had jobs but the jobs that they had just weren't enough to keep them stable in their new home and their new home life so then Kayla said that oh I actually know of a real estate agent that lives out here in South Carolina I met him a few years ago through one of my exes I bet he would have a job for me sort of as like a side job taking two part-time jobs and making that a sort of full-time job He found Todd online and was like, hey Todd I don't know if you remember me, but we met a few years ago I just recently moved to South Carolina and Kayla asked Todd like hey Is it okay if I get a job and Todd replies to Kayla saying like oh, that's actually really crazy You messaged me because I was actually looking for someone who can work part-time and clean the houses So basically what her job consisted of is that she would go to the houses that uh, Todd was about to present to people and she would clean it up you know like arrange the flowers do a little bit of interior design make it look all nice and pretty she actually ended up doing around two open houses that went extremely well until Todd actually offered to Kayla hey if your boyfriend is also looking for a job you guys can actually work together if you want and you guys can both you know clean the houses and what not. Kayla's like, oh my god, like, thank you so much. This actually means a lot because apparently at the time Charles was having a really hard time finding, like, a good paying side job. Charles and Kayla were extremely ecstatic to hear about these new part-time jobs that were going to afford their, you know, lifestyle in this new house. On the first trip that Kayla and Charles went on, it was to this house that was on nine acres of land in the middle of nowhere in Kayla and Charles. Charles's mind, they think that they're coming to this house to clean it and make it look all nice. It's probably just like some farmhouse that a lot of people are looking for that Todd is probably selling because as I said, he's already done like two successful open houses with Kayla to kind of gain her trust and make her think that, you know, this isn't sketchy or anything. Got to the house, they went inside and then when they went inside, Todd was like, oh wait, you guys stay here. I actually forgot something in the garage. Todd goes back out of the room and then shortly after walks through the front door with a gun in his hand and Kayla actually describes this moment. Todd was typically a very easygoing guy like he was very easy to make conversation with but in this moment has never seen Todd so scary and serious as if a switch had gone off. Immediately when he walked through the door he had a gun in his hand and he shot Charles in the chest three times in front of Kayla. Obviously Kayla is extremely traumatized so she starts screaming, freaking out, and immediately uh, Todd handcuffs her and drags her over to his chamber. It was like an empty metal storage container. And so he dragged her in there, handcuffed her, and basically kept her there. Kayla's time in there, this is how she describes a typical day would go. She was chained at the arms, neck, and hands, and she was let out from one to three and five to seven. She was allowed one meal a day, one bathroom break, and one water bottle to not only drink, but also bathe herself in. And when she was let out from one to three and five to seven, they would go to this room in the garage. It was basically like a 
torture chamber like it was a mattress on the floor there were chains on the wall like it was just it was really really messed up in there they found like a bunch of really messed up stuff in there as well which i'll get into later when they're actually like you know discovering the area and that's actually how kayla's life would go every single day for the next three months while all of this was going on he actually didn't want to raise any suspicion so what he did is that he stole charles's phone and started posting really bizarre things from charles's phone but his family members like immediately caught on because it was very odd for charles to be super active on facebook it raised a lot of really big red flags now at this point uh kayla's best friend as well as like her family members started to reach out to kayla but kayla was not responding so since charles was on facebook all the time people sort of assumed that charles had something to do with the disappearance of kayla and they started to get extremely worried for kayla so they would comment on charles's uh facebook post saying like what did you do with kayla where is she like we'll give you all the money you want like just please leave her alone and obviously charles is dead and this is all todd so he doesn't really know how to reply because he doesn't know how charles would reply charles family members were commenting on these like random facebook posts and saying things like just to let you guys know this is not charles we actually tried to contact him a few days ago but he's not answering the phone this is probably some like like perpetrator trying to play a game on everyone tried to get the police involved but as you know the police love to not do their job so instead they just thought oh it's not that big of a deal let's just let's just chill out everyone all right we could easily look at the location of where these posts were posted at because as i said todd literally had both of their phones and was posting on charles's facebook from the farmhouse so they could have easily looked at the location of where these things were being posted from and then went to that location but instead they were like you know what let's just uh let's forget about it and so then they did for like an entire three months while kayla is like oh my god can you guys hurry up and not okay and this was another thing is that todd through charles's facebook account would also like all of like the missing persons posts and like all of the fundraisers trying to find the two people whilst these things were being posted onto charles's account todd was actually posting some really suspicious things onto his own account as well he would talk about how like this generation doesn't know how to act and like when he was younger he would get beat and it sucks that like you can't do that anymore it's like talking about random things that like are would typically be kind of pardon you know like curtis connor pardon, pardon? <laughs> it was just like really really odd to see todd posting these things but again like no one really batted an eye this is the part where i get into the amazon reviews actually this is the part where i don't get into the amazon reviews because i literally mentioned it and then i never said anything i started to say like a lot more at the end but i didn't want you guys to wait that long you basically buy like his kidnapping starter kit on amazon prime you'll see later on how Todd just doesn't really know how the internet works like this man was on Amazon and he was like oh my god I love the dark web he would buy like all of his shovels his tape his chains his padlocks on Amazon not only would he buy the things on Amazon he would also write reviews for them one of the things being for a fixed blade saying that it's nice to see someone with shackle padlocks good for people who talk back small shovel used for travel size in case you need to dump a body on the go great for the car and you left the big shovel at home oopsies chainsaw which is good to chase people with and so many other ones as well the police started looking into todd um because they got his name they, like somehow found his amazon and was like wait now what is this and so that's kind of another factor that was played into how he got caught because he was literally just like confessing to his crimes um out in the open so yeah cha-ching now you know they ended up you know just easily pinging the phones and found the location and they were like oh here she is haha -ha. we are so goofy three months later we are so goofy sorry about that 
uh, anyways, let's go. And so then they start creating like this plan on how to approach the situation because they're like, okay, if this guy's in the middle of nowhere and he's committing these crimes and he's like this messed up, he obviously probably has some like really illegal guns or something like that in the house. And so if he knows that we're about to attack on him, we don't want him to do anything to Kayla. So they're trying to sculpt a plan basically on how to exactly approach the situation. Todd, he used to get away with his crimes back in 2003. He again just had like this very big ego, this very big like, oh, I can get away with anything I want. He kind of didn't realize how much technology could turn against him. He kept the phones and didn't even think that possibly the police could track the phones and find the location. Posting on this Facebook account didn't even think that the police could look back at the location of where these posts were sent from. I don't think Todd really understood that he could easily be caught with everything that he was doing and so eventually he was because on November 3rd the police showed up at Todd's house. He had another house that he surprised actually had a girlfriend and son of 10 years that he was living at this house with, not like the ranch house in the middle of nowhere, at like a real house. You were the last person to see them and there's some other information that, based on some information that, that Anderson Police Department received, they had contacted us for an assisting an agency report. Um, we have a search warrant. Okay. We are mainly looking for your cell phone. Okay. Okay. Well, what I need—I need to go in. With, we, we I at least him need to go in with you. There was a set of police officers that went to his real house to talk to Todd, kind of keep him stalled, while another set of people went over to the ranch and tried to like deconstruct the area and find if like Kayla and Charles or even like if their bodies are there. At the house, they're asking all these questions about if he knows any information about Kayla or Charles, if they could search the house or even if they could search his phone. Now, at this time, Todd, again, just thought that he was so above the police because he was like, yeah, you can search my phone, you can search my house, you'll find nothing because I had nothing to do with it. He didn't know that the other people were at his house investigating the area. The, he just thought like, oh, they're obviously not gonna find anything there because they don't know about my secret secret house. Well, literally, a set of police officers were over there deconstructing the area. They actually were looking across the land, they went into the houses and that's when they discovered the garage, the dungeon. All of a sudden, as they're looking around the area, they hear a bang and yelling coming from the inside of this metal storage container. They start hearing this banging and they realize that there is six padlocks on this huge container. Three of them had different keys than the other three. So even if you got three padlocks off, like because you found a key, you'll still have three more padlocks to go through because it required a different key. Now with this, the rescue team basically took like a big, I don't know what that's called, like an oscillating saw, I think it's called, something to cut through metal and they cut through all six of the padlocks. And this is actually live footage of them discovering Kayla. Watch out, y'all move. What's your name? What's your name, man? Just a girl. Just a girl, just a girl. How are you, honey? This is, this, bolt is, cutters. this is our best friend. He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Todd Hep shot Charlie Carver three times in the chest, wrapped him in a blue tarp, put him in the bucket of the tractor, locked me down here, and I never seen him again. Okay. He says he's dead and buried. He says there's several bodies dead and buried out here. And he okay. says that the dogs will be ruined if they go looking because there's red pepper. We're going to step you out, sweet dog. He says no, there's pepper weird. everywhere around the car. The first was in a ravine under the land. Okay. Supposedly covered and painted. As you saw, Kayla was just like immediately when she saw the police just started confessing and like telling them everything as quickly as possible. Because I feel like when you're in that moment for three months, you kind of imagine this moment of being rescued 
in the moment where like you're you're free finally at last like when at times it felt like it was going to last forever like it's finally done you feel this need to just like say everything possible because you don't know if you're ever going to have an opportunity to she ended up like spilling everything right on the spot even when she was in the ambulance going to the hospital she again kept on like just spilling everything that was inside of her get there between 1 and 3 o'clock every day, take me up to the main building, feed me, make me do whatever he wanted to fully, and then he'd put me back in the building, and then he would always come back between 5 and 7, take me back up to the building, feed me again, most of the time, do whatever, do whatever I mean, he wanted sexually again, and I refused to do anything he wanted. Once they got Kayla, they started to look at the area. Inside of the storage unit, there was a bunch of like dirty mattresses. There was a sleeping bag in there as well as if like Todd had spent the night with Kayla a few times. There was a bunch of amp ignition in there the chains all over the walls as if he would like change her position every now and again also like very high so that like even if she wanted to lay down she couldn't she was kind of like forced to sit upright a bunch of random books it basically just looked extremely terrible now they also found a bunch of todd's illegal guns and ammunition which by the way when he got those guns and ammunition they didn't even run a background check on him so literally he was just getting all of these like extremely dangerous guns that he did use end up committing crimes with they didn't do a background check on him going back to kayla in the ambulance she was also like telling the police and other people just all these stories of how todd told her that one day he was going to teach her how to kill people so that they could do it together and he was actually planning on killing uh his girlfriend of 10 years and their son and so he was hoping that kayla would one day help him out execute those crimes and even after all of the traumatizing things that kayla went through todd would continue to say to her that one day stockholm syndrome would kick in and she would actually appreciate all of the amazing things that he's doing for her going back to where todd is at at the house so the police get a call from like the ranch saying hey we got kayla we've confirmed that it's Kayla like lock him up bring him downtown boys the police tell Todd hey we found Kayla and you're gonna be arrested this is where we're at Mr. Collette while we were here all right my sergeant served a search warrant on your property okay, okay? we have Kayla Excuse me? we have Kayla in your property she was locked in a container okay she has told us that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay, so at this time I'm gonna need you to stand up and put your hands behind he's, your back. He's already killed. Okay, you're under arrest right now for kidnapping. All right, they're continue to search your property. They're gonna continue to bring. They got cadaver dogs down there. If you want to help yourself, tell me where Charlie's at, so we can go find his body. That's that's pretty much where we're at right now. Do you want to help yourself and tell me where the body's at so we can go recover Charlie's body? No, sir. You don't want to? No, sir. Okay. She ain't sir. Okay, why'd you lock her in a container in your property? I was talking about She's on your property right now, locked in a container. She was locked in a container in a comment box. They got her. We, are, we have investigators. We have like 20 investigators on your property right now. So she never left your property. Okay, you locked her in the connect box, okay? So I'm trying to give you an opportunity to help yourself and help us, help you find this body. 
because Charlie, she's saying Charlie's body, you buried Charlie's body on that property. So you're saying you didn't lock her up, you didn't put her in the convict box or anything? No, sir. I'm going to need an Probably a good thing. Go ahead and put him in the back of your car. As you saw in that clip, he's very like, I don't know. It's It looks like a person pretending to be confused, even though deep down he's like in shock of like, oh my God, are you kidding me? They can do that. They can ping phones. That's crazy. Technology is dangerous, you guys. It's getting like way too advanced. How did they find me? I thought I was like so incognito. Yeah, we're obviously going to arrest you. And at first he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. He was just denying, which makes sense because that's typically what a lot of people do. They'll just deny, deny, deny in hopes that helps anything at all. Eventually he got to the station. He took his mug shots. And then that is when he decided to start confessing to all of the heinous acts that he committed. Before taking him into actual jail, they actually asked him to lead them to Charles's body. Now, upon location of the body, they actually found Kayla and Charles's car as, and it was like so weird because the car was in a ditch but it was like spray painted brown as if he was trying to camouflage it. Kind of looked like he got halfway through it and then he ran out of spray paint and he was like, ah, they won't know. Uh, there's a car in here? Where? I, I don't see it. So they ended up finding the car pretty easily as well as Charles's body. Now, not only did they find Charles's body, they found two other corpses as well, which Todd later confessed to being a woman named Megan and a guy named Johnny. Now, Megan and Johnny were in the similar situations as Kayla and Charles in that they were looking for some extra side work. And so what he did, offered them both a job to clean houses and whatnot. And when he took them, to this ranch he claims that when this couple went to his house he went in the house and then he you know did his thing he left went to grab a gun like oh i forgot something leaves grabs a gun, and then comes back he actually says that johnny the boyfriend actually had a knife to him obviously todd had no other choice but to sh Johnny three times in the chest, right in front of Megan. According to Todd, Megan was actually a huge drug addict. She was also bipolar and she was having a baby currently and that baby ended up testing positive for heroin. So they were just like both not in the best of places. Like they really, really needed to clean themselves up and make some extra money. Like they were taking the step forward to getting a real job, actually trying to do something with their lives. Todd explains the event. Johnny falls to the ground. Megan immediately, like rightfully so, starts freaking out. Todd ends up getting mad at Megan for freaking out, hitting things, throwing things, trying to escape because honestly, like a uh, show of hands, how many people would try to run away after seeing that? He ended up handcuffing Megan to a pole, left her in the house, he left the house, and Todd actually confesses this was the first time that he started to panic about what he was going to do to Megan, what where he was going to put Megan, and Megan was screaming and freaking out in the house, so what does he do with her? And he actually describes this time to have happened around like December, Christmas time. So crazy because Okay, let me talk about the interview for a second. So I was watching this interview and like the way that Todd explains the situation and like explains Megan is so, so disgusting. And not only is that disgusting, as you just saw, like when he made that comment, both of the detectives didn't say anything. They didn't make a joke about it. They honestly just pretended like they didn't hear it because that's disgusting. So then all of a sudden he's explaining this situation again to another detective that he's like having a meal with. And for some reason, the detective like makes jokes back to Todd. You laugh your ass off. Really? Oh God. What, black and white tiger stripe. It was one of those- The handle? The one time you buy at the little convenience store? Are you serious? <laughs> I'm going, my ammo costs more than your, than your damn knife. Are you kidding me? <clears throat> you're, costing, you're costing me money. But you're going to stab me. At least stab me with a butt knife or something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> something with some, something wrong with a little history. You know. Who gets the thing up on the doing? I'm dissing after you, Johnny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
peaceful death thing out and I went not the only time it happens there are so many times in this interview where you it feels like you're watching just like a bunch of guys having a conversation like they're laughing they're making jokes i don't know there's two sides to it you could say that like oh they're supposed to do that because it's a lot easier to get a confession that way because then it makes them feel like they're friends and that like oh we can tell anything to each other because you guys get it on the flip side i do feel like there is a fine line between like being friends with them and trying to get the confession but also having respect for the victims that may or may not read this transcript in court or even like hear this statement or watch this interview at some point in their life i feel like if i was the victim and i saw that i would feel like so belittled like my situation isn't even that important to these people that they're just laughing and joking around about my trauma is this literally how just men talk to each other as i said like there were a lot of detectives who like didn't even bat an eye didn't give it any attention but then there were other ones who like laugh and so going back to megan and johnny because as i said he decided to kill johnny but he didn't know what to do with megan so he had megan in the storage container for about two days and then on christmas that is when he decided to shoot Megan in the back of the head. When he describes his time with Megan, again, it's very degrading and pretending. He just wants himself to be the good guy so much that he tries to like find the good in everything so that it makes him look like a good person when in reality, like you literally someone when you didn't have to kill someone like you are not a good person it's not like for example like in a gang or something like that and you have to kill someone because someone orders you to do it and like your life and everyone else's life is at risk then like in that case it's like you have to do this but in todd's case he literally did not have to do it like it was out of his free will to go out of his way and do something actually the original plan was that he was going to send her to tennessee with a four thousand dollar reward and just drop her off somewhere and go her separate way he ended up never doing that and just killing her anyway. So now once he confessed to all of these killings, Kayla revealed everything that she knew. There is a whole interview. She went on Dr. Phil and basically explained her time there. So if you're like very, very intrigued by her time there, you can go watch the Dr. Phil documentary. I'm not sure if I can put in clips. I think that's copyright. So that's wonderful. Whilst he's also in custody, he tends to also blame Kayla for a lot of his crimes. He says that it was actually Kayla Kayla's idea and she initiated the sexual acts a lot and she also tried to like praise him and tell him everything that he wanted to hear not even really taking into effect that if Kayla did sort of like compliment him or praise him it was probably because she was scared and she wanted to be on his good side to ensure that like if she you know acted up or anything she wouldn't die like, that's what a lot of people would do you would try to appeal to the person that's kidnapping you so that one day maybe they trust you enough and then that little bit of trust that you gained that will be your ticket for like your way out and now they also interviewed uh as i said todd's 10-year girlfriend and she said that she had not a single clue of what todd was doing because all of this was going down at a different house she just kind of assumed that while like todd was out all day that he was at work doing real estate which sometimes he was but most of the time he was there either torturing kayla as i said it was every day from one to three and five to seven you can't work a normal work day with going out for two hours of the day now in the end todd actually ended up pleading guilty to seven accounts of murder two accounts of kidnapping as well as sexual assault and he received four life sentences plus 65 years and no chance of parole now in the aftermath after todd had received his sentence kayla actually sued todd for all of the disgusting horrible things things that he did to her and also lying to her about employment and she ended up getting give it up y'all 6.3 million dollars as she should as she should obviously money is not a band-aid like it's not going to help really anything but it is good to know that as i said like she was kind of struggling for money in her own life 
for her funding of her house. That's why she needed to pick up a second job. But it's kind of good to know that she did get enough money. So if she does want to get therapy or counseling or stuff like that, she now has the ability to do so. Kind of a really weird switch. In 2019, she was actually arrested with uh, three accounts of domestic abuse on her boyfriend at the time. I, I, I don't know. I just had to say that because that's what happened. But obviously she's very like traumatized and doesn't really know how to react in situations anymore. So that was it. Um, I went for like a really pretty, I don't know, like a princess sort of look, like a Bridgerton. Let's do a fit check real quick. This skirt, I don't know where it came from. These boots are from Walmart. Again, I bought them like four years ago because I really wanted Doc Martens, but I couldn't afford it. So I got these instead. This shirt I got from like one of those uh, mystery bags at Goodwill. Side note, if you get the mystery bags from Goodwill, don't because they're not that good. These pearls I got a, at a garage sale. That's basically it. The princess sort of with the braids in the front and the pearls and my we won't talk about that. That is today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed. As far as my own thoughts and opinions, um, I don't really have many thoughts or opinions. I feel like Todd just really tried it. Like he really, he really tried to make himself seem like the good guy when in fact he wasn't um and i think like again that it's so disgusting need i talk about detective situation again i thought that it was really crazy that the police took three months to find her even though they could have easily tracked back to where the post was taken like i feel like anyone could do that not just the police but just like a regular person could easily just do that i am glad that todd got life in prison and he's never getting out even though todd was in jail for for 13 years because of his crimes he literally just got back out and started doing it again especially in the interviews kind of explaining it as if he was the good guy or oh of course I wasn't trying to hurt them I was trying to help them and it's like if you're helping someone maybe don't kill them maybe that is something you shouldn't do when you're trying to help someone not not a good idea as far as Kayla she did commit like domestic abuse and stuff like that but I truly do feel like it just all stems from her being extremely traumatized about the situation and like you would never come out of a situation like that like golden you know like good as new again like it does take a very very long time to get back up on your feet again i don't think you'll ever act like your old self again more of just like a stronger version of your old self in a way so i really hope that kayla is doing fine now and she's living her best life yeah and as for todd i hope the prison people prison people prisoners <laughs> prison people i hope the prisoners don't like him and they call him names and they make him feel bad about it because he should feel bad about it. He needs to get off of his high horse and realize not everybody is his friend. So that is the story of Todd Kolip. Um, Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and if you did, make sure to give a big thumbs up and subscribe. And if you wanna follow me on any of my social media such as Instagram or TikTok, that will be linked down below as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything. And also, also, Did y'all see that? Did y'all? I'll replay it in slow mo. That will be linked down below, as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything. And also, also. Please tell me that was dust. You saw my last video. The veil is getting thinner, and girl, if the veil is getting thinner, I'ma sleep through Halloween because. Oh, and the craziest part is if you continue watching the outro, you can see so many. You can see so many more. There's like way too many of them, and it's not like I was like doing anything. Me doing doing a cleansing girl get out of here get out of here <laughs> get out of here that's so crazy i have to sleep in here hey sleep over time sleep over time sleep over time the ghosts are like okay maybe it happened like a I, I don't know. It was so weird. It was like a do and then it came back for more and then it whoop, whoop. hopefully it's not a ghost hopefully it is Oh, ooh, 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 ooh. 
I thought I just heard someone outside my door. I said, please, God, please, God, forgive me for my sins. I believe in you now. I believe in you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I would give you the world, baby girl. I'm going to sing that to the ghosts if they ever show up. I'm gonna give you the world, baby girl. You're like, actually, let's haunt another girl. This one is really annoying. If you, you know, have been watching this video and you're like, girl, what is that foundation? What is this or what is that? Uh, that will all be linked down in the description box as well. So, oh yeah. And also thank you to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video. That's beautiful. Um, should I suggest something? I went to this record store and I bought this record. So what I do, I go to record stores and, and I buy a record that has like a really cool album art. I feel like that's a really interesting way to just discover new music. I got this one, Golden Earring, Mad Love. I think the album art is so cool, especially the back. I've really, really been loving a particular song on this called Fighting Windmills. There's been times where I bought records and I'm like, wow, this should never have been a thing. Like this sucks. But then other times like this time I'll buy it and I'll be like, whoa, wait, why do I really like this song? Or why do I really like this band? So yes, I hope you guys have a beautiful rest of your day and make sure to drink some water today. Make sure to go outside because it's almost fall time. Oh my God, I can already smell it in the air. And I hope you guys have a cool and fun day. Being said, do something that makes you I always giggle when I do this. With that being said, do something that makes you happy today.